Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to our worship for this Sunday. How lovely to welcome people joining us in person and those who are joining us online as well. Welcome. Um, I hope everything is on the um, email that I sent to those online or on the various different methods I put it together. If you've got large print, it's all on one sheet. If you've got others, you should have um, hymn book, an order of service and an extra piece of paper because that has an extra hymn on. And on the back of that is today's reading for you all to follow. Well, let's turn to the beginnings of our service and uh, to an opening prayer, which you'll find uh, on page one of our yellow booklets. As we remember God's presence with us, let's commend ourselves to him and open our hearts to him afresh. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Our opening hymn is number 481 in our hymn books. <clears throat> it's Name of All Majesty, a hymn that focuses on the person of Jesus, who he is, and his significance for us all. That's number 481, Name of All Majesty. Let's stand for you. Jesus as the saviour of Calvary and we're reminded in the Bible that God so loved the world that he gave his only son Jesus Christ to save us from our sins, to be our advocate in heaven and to bring us to eternal life. Therefore let us confess our sins as we come to remind ourselves of God's promise in words from 1 John 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, 
God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from every kind of wrong. So we pray together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <laughs> and today's collect, the collect for the third Sunday of Epiphany. Almighty God, whose Son revealed in signs and miracles the wonder of your saving presence. Renew your people with your heavenly grace. And in all our weakness, sustain us by your mighty power. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We come to today's reading. As we continue our readings through Luke's Gospel, we come to Luke chapter 4, and Jesus returning home to his hometown of Nazareth. Yeah. The reading this morning then is Luke chapter 4, uh, verses 14 to 30. And if you're following that in the church Bibles, it's on page 1031. Jesus rejected at Nazareth. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal thyself, and you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a, uh, to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. This is the word of the Lord. I printed on the separate pieces of paper um, a, a new hymn for us to learn this morning. Um, again, it's by one of the favourite modern hymn writers, Stuart Tannen. And it's a hymn that again speaks about Jesus. You are the word of the Father from before the world began. If, um, 
Sam is very glad, kind of glad to come and lead us in singing this together. It's got a tune that's very easy to pick up, so don't worry about that, but uh, join with it as soon as you possibly can. Let's start. Play a it's only possessing two hands. This is a lovely song. It's all about the identity of Jesus and what he's done for us. And um, I thought we'd uh, learn it together this morning. So follow me and, uh, and we should be fine. So I'll, I'll sing a little bit and then I'll invite us to sing a little bit. And once, once we've got the hang of it, then we can, uh, we can sing the whole thing through.
Well, you may like to turn back to our Bible reading, which, as I say, is on the back of those slips of paper for most of you. Um, for those online, uh, if you turn to the end of my email, there's a copy of the sermon to follow. Since Christmas, we've started our journey looking at the life of Jesus. Uh, Luke was one of the two gospelers who recorded Jesus' birth, so we followed that through. And since his birth, we've seen his first, his, his baptism, um, his first miracle. And today we see him starting his public preaching ministry at his own home in Nazareth, which he's finally returned to after a time as a refugee uh, in his younger years. So geographically, we're, we're back in Israel. We're in the northern part of Israel. We're halfway between the Mediterranean Ocean on the one side and the Sea of Galilee, um, if you can imagine that, in a place called Nazareth. Uh, just a small place, again, um, away from the centre of human civilization, which at that point of time was in Rome. Uh, this was just the hometown of Mary and Joseph, where Joseph had a carpentry business. It wouldn't be well known, and um, what reputation it did have, we gather, was rather poor, even for this backwater in the Middle East. Um, people had a nickname for people who came from Nazareth, and to be called a Nazarene was a rather derogatory slur. It tended to suggest you were somewhat backward and thoughtless and so on. And it was a negative name that stuck with Jesus and his disciples uh, in years to come. Anyway, Luke takes his camera from the temptation which precedes this, which we'll come back to in a period of Lent, and follows him to Galilee and zooms on this one day when Jesus travels to his own home, hometown and starts to worship with others in the synagogue. And to appreciate the impact of our reading, we have to see where this chapter leads. In, in our passage, everyone seems to appreciate Jesus just fine. Verse 15, he was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. If you look on even to verse 22, it says they all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. By verse 28, as we heard at the end of our reading, this same group of people has turned into a, an angry mob. Verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him up to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Remember the beginning of John's Gospel, which we also heard at Christmas time? Uh, there's that verse in John chapter 1 where it says, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Well, this would be an example of that. It turns out that some people just can't seem to handle Jesus when he starts to speak. And Nazareth is the first place that shows us that. Now, I'm using that term, they couldn't handle Jesus, in the same way we would use it. We talk about being able to handle something when we mean we can't face it. I, I can't handle giving blood because of the thought of a needle in my arm. Uh, or we use the phrase when we feel uncomfortable with another person. I don't think I can handle being around them all day, or whatever it might be. So I'm in the same way the people of Nazareth couldn't handle Jesus. Why is that? What is it that turns people from thinking he was at least a pretty okay guy into wanting to throw a person off a cliff? Well, that's the question I hope we can look at as we ponder this passage this morning. I, I want us to do it because I want us to answer it for ourselves. Because let's face it, there are some things about Jesus that we find uncomfortable. He challenges us. He makes us face our faults. We don't always handle this very well. I want us to identify those things that we're aware of them. And I also want us to be able to answer it for the sake of other people who are struggling with Jesus so that we can understand others much better and have more understanding and address some of the issues. So what's the first reason? 
in this passage? Why can't people handle Jesus? And the first uh, answer I give to that is in verses 14 to 16, where he's simply too familiar to them. It says, verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was preaching, he was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. Now, it seems clear Jesus was in the practice of worshipping every week. Verse 16 tells us that it was his custom to go along to synagogues with family, friends, whoever he was with. Uh, and we need to note that it's uh, important for us, I think, who, who've perhaps gone out of the habit of weekly attendance of things to recognise that this is something Jesus set us a pattern of. Um, it's important to worship with others. It's not a solitary calling that uh, we have as Christians. Uh, he'd been teaching the and the news got round. There's this young rabbi in town. Let's go and listen to him. And you can imagine what it was like when he came home. This town's one synagogue was probably pretty crowded that Sabbath, and there they all were, men on one side, women on the other, as was their custom. Uh, and there in the front is a cabinet containing the synagogue's most precious possessions, the scrolls, the books of Moses and the prophets. And someone first gets up to read from the books of Moses, then the reader pauses after a verse to allow the interpreter to translate from uh, Hebrew into Aramaic, which they spoke. And the synagogue leaders and rulers are all seated at the front facing the congregation. It's, it's their job to read and interpret these lessons from the laws and the prophets. But there's a visiting rabbi, isn't there? Let's get him to say a few words. It's his teacher whose fame is spreading across the nation. And he's a hometown boy. Let's see what Jesus has to say. And we're told that Jesus gets up to read. And verse 17 tells us what he chose. It says, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And rolling it, he found the place where it's written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then told he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, at this point, as we've already touched upon, all spoke well of him, were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. And then there's this just little jarring note, isn't it? Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. And the reason that's there, I think, who noticed it is because they were familiar with Jesus. Their kids had grown up with him. They'd been at feasts and funerals with him. They knew his face. They probably had pieces of furniture in their home which were marked with Joseph initials or, or perhaps even Jesus as a young apprentice. They knew his voice. They had memories about him. He was familiar. And, and after some 30 years in Nazareth, people kind of took him for granted. He's, he's the carpenter's son. Well, no, actually he wasn't. He wasn't Joseph's son. They didn't really know him at all, but they thought they did. And all around this morning are people with a similar difficulty. People think they know who Jesus is. Jesus is familiar, very familiar. But the question is, do we really know him? I was quite struck. I was looking through a, a book on the history of art, and there's more artwork centered around Jesus than any other person in history. But the truth is, we are not at all sure what he looked like. Now, I could show you a, an image from a great painting. You say, oh, that's Jesus. Uh, mostly because we've got a way of painting him, certainly in Western culture. Um, and the average person would be able to say, oh, yes, that Jesus is in this We think we know him. In, in this country, um, I was in London where I went to see some Victorian works of art. There's even one artist who painted him with blonde hair, which would be fascinating. You try to kind of imagine Jesus with long, long, flowing hair. Uh, from a guy from the Middle East, a Jewish guy, hardly likely. 
And if you look at books on the history of art, you can see that if you go to Africa or China or Italy or Japan, you'll find other pictures of Jesus painted with faces familiar in their own culture, not at all like the first century. <coughs> you know, there's something lovely about that. It means that lots of people identify with Jesus in their own way. But equally, those pictures ought to tell us something. We don't really know him. We don't know what he looked like. And yet we think we do. But hang on, am I saying then that Jesus doesn't really want us to know what he's like? No. He wants us to truly know him. But to know him falsely is the problem that many people have. We get so familiar, we take him for granted. While Jesus was just the local hometown boy and could read a bit of a the scrolls and so on, there was no problem. But the moment he started challenging the people of his own time, they said, hang on a minute, he's just Joseph's lad. And I didn't even know he wasn't. And it's this superficial familiarity that means we're able to keep Jesus at a distance. If we can keep a familiar version of him on the canvas or on a book page, we don't have to let him into our lives. But when he goes from being the carpenter's son to the son of God, the Lord of creation, as we've sung, that's rather harder to handle. We can look at a painting of Jesus on the cross and handle that, but when we're called to actually bow there and worship him as our only possible saviour because he died on the cross and call him our own Lord and King, well, that's where people can't always handle it. Even this morning, some of us perhaps aren't appreciating Jesus the way we should because we've come to know him as that rather rosy cheek picture, uh, picture on the wall rather than someone who commands hosts of angels in heaven, someone who demands our allegiance without question. We need to get past that over-familiar acquaintance with Jesus and truly get to know him. So that's one reason. He's too familiar to many. There's another reason people can't handle Jesus. That's that he's too challenging. Let's think for a moment about why Jesus spoke about this particular passage that was read from Isaiah. Look, look back at verse 18 with me. Um, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me for, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's saviour. Savior, now in one way, that's incredibly uplifting. It, it's God promising to help the most needy. But it's not very complimentary to those hearing it addressed to them. This may be good news for those who are poor, good news for the imprisoned, good news for the blind, good news for the oppressed. It's okay for, for people like that, but what about us? That's not how most people want to think about their lives. We tend to think, my life's not perfect, but it's not in that much of a mess, thank you very much. And there's the problem. My eldest sister, as some of you know, was a doctor, a GP. Um, she's been helping out the pandemic, but otherwise she retired a couple of years ago. Um, and life with a white coat and a stethoscope has its up, certainly. She's living a very comfortable life, but it also has its downs. And talking to my sister, one of the hardest things she ever had to do was break the bad news to patients who were coming to her when they had a terminal illness and it was discovered. Now that was bad enough when they already knew that something was wrong, but far more difficult when they thought they were basically okay and a couple of aspirins would do the trick. If instead what was needed was radical surgery or if there was just no cure, well that was really hard news to pass on. Some people things are worse than they thought. It's not easy. 
You know, maybe it didn't bring on the other end of such an encounter, and you remember how awful that is. But, but that's what's going on here in Nazareth when Jesus says to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Of course, it doesn't sink straight in for those in Nazareth. They're initially quite comfortable with this. They're quite thrilled to have this local chat. But then he starts to apply it. And by verse 23, everything has come apart. Why is that? Well, Nazareth isn't a whole lot different from a place where you or I live or work, or a place where you would go to school. They'd accept him as a carpenter, they'd accept him as a teacher, they'd accept him as a local celebrity, they'd even on their day accepted him as a reader and a teacher, but when it comes to telling them about themselves and challenging their view of themselves, then they couldn't handle it. Lots of people today will accept Jesus as a good teacher. If you play that game where you can choose five people from history that you'd like to have to come to dinner with you at a dinner party, Jesus would be at the top of many people's lists. But people forget how challenging that would be. How challenging he is. Part of the revolution in our thinking that Jesus brings about is the growing realisation that However much money we have tucked away, we are poor if we yet to discover the amazing riches of knowing him. However much liberty we think we have to do what we want, we're the ones locked up in prison if we've yet to discover the freedom of his forgiveness and what it means to be paradoxically his servant, which is freer than living our own selfish life. However much we think we have our life sorted out, we may be blind because there's no greater blindness than those they think they can see, but cannot. And however in control of things we think we are, we are depressed if we don't realise our freedom to do what we like goes against the purpose for which we're made. That's the challenge Jesus presented to his own hometown. And he told them, it was for that very reason he wasn't going to be able to do very many things. There's a, an extra bit in my um, sermon which I've sent out that will cover the next few verses where Jesus basically challenges his little local community. I'm not going to be able to do very much here because you're not open. And if you think about it historically, God's come to this point several times. So um, Elijah had to go off to a widow way outside his own local community. Um, Naaman was healed of leprosy when local people were not and so on. He said, look, you're not open, you're not listening. After leaving school, I had the joy of going around Europe on one of these interrail tickets with my, again, with my elder sister. And um, we went all around Europe and ended up in the last well, day, a day from the end in Copenhagen. I went into the church there, the cathedral there, where there's a statue of Jesus. And it, it's a pretty impressive piece of work, large stuff. Uh, but to see its real beauty, because it's kind of strangely out of perspective, you actually have to kneel down below it to see it in its true perspective. And it's been made in just that way, so that only at that angle, on your knees in front of it, can it be truly appreciated. And the truth is, Christianity has very little to offer to those whose lives are already sorted, who are standing on their own two feet as they see it. But if we're prepared to kneel at Jesus' feet and admit our need for him, well then, the very things promised here, good news, freedom, recovery of sight, and release, are all the promises that he delights to fulfill. And that's the second reason people don't want to handle Jesus. He's too challenging. And then one final thought, and a, a shorter one. Uh, verses 28 to 30, he's too powerful. All the people in the synagogue, it says, verse 28, were furious when they heard what he was saying. They got up, drove him out of the city and took him to the, or sorry, town, sorry, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd 
and went on his way. That's a miracle. Jesus isn't just a slippery customer or a fast runner. This angry mob was going to kill him. You can imagine that. What a drive. Church people, synagogue people, they want to throw some off the hill. Well, the answer is they, <coughs> they saw, not well, just his challenge, but he was effectively setting himself up as God's representative, speaking God's words to them. They didn't like it. They'd already forced him out of the town, out to the edge of the cliff, but that's where it stopped. The time wasn't right. Somehow, we're not even told how, but just miraculously, Jesus passed through the crush and put an end to it all. Well, up to this point, I've been talking about people's inability to handle Jesus, and here's another one. Jesus will go to the cross and die according to his plan. He isn't going to have his life accidentally ended on this particular day in Nazareth. They don't accept him because he demands that he be called Lord, and now they can't destroy him because he is the Lord. They can't handle Jesus because he's too powerful. I find myself wondering, what were they saying as Jesus walked right through them? What was the look on their faces as they just let him by? Did they have the same attitude as only a moment before? Actually, what I see in this story is a preview, ultimately, of everybody's confession of Jesus. The Bible tells us that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's in Philippians chapter 2. <coughs> but we can proclaim that now and live like it with great joy. Or we can deny it now and one day, when it's too late, proclaim it Lord with awe and fear. took a few of us last week and I buried a person. Well, not, well, not really. What we buried, of course, was somebody's body. They themselves had gone. But you know what? One day, maybe even later today, because we don't know when it's going to happen, there, there's going to be some kind of staggeringly loud shout. There's going to be a blast of a trumpet that's going to be heard worldwide. And Jesus is going to come through the clouds, just like he left. And all around, the people who died with Jesus as their Lord are going to rise up from the dead and be joined with him with new bodies and launch into the sky. And if we're alive when that happens, we're next. We who remain are going to be caught up with them and launched into the clouds where all together we're going to meet the Lord and be done with every bad thing that's ever happened on this earth. At least that's the imagery, the picture we're presented in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, I'm not sure what's going to happen with all the people for whom it's too late who rejected Jesus to that point. But I'm pretty sure of one thing. As they stand there and watch this happen, every one of them is going to know that Jesus Christ is Lord. So we've got to up on. You don't just stand by and watch and remain unaffected by this. One day, the time of every unbelieving person is going to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. That's what the scriptures tell us. And the trouble is, you can't <coughs> handle that kind of power. What you need to do is let him handle you. And that's the challenge of our verses. When we think we can't handle it because he's, we've made him too familiar or because He's too challenging because he's too powerful. We need to stand back and change the perspective. And instead of trying to handle him, we need to let him start handling us and change our lives. Amen. Don't you stand and reaffirm the Christian faith. The, the familiar words we're going to read, the Nicene Creed, um, 
But as we do so, perhaps we can take on board what they say about believing God the Father Almighty, about Jesus and what he's going to come and do and what he will do when he'll come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And let the words sink into our thoughts rather than just be uh, something we say by rote, as it were. Let's stand together and reaffirm the Christian faith. As we say together, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten from the day, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I'm going to turn to prayer at this point. Perhaps just a moment of quiet. And then I've asked um, three or four people to lead a prayer or two. So if uh, number one would really go out with it in just a moment or two. Do, do take a seat as we come to prayer. Um, you may like to take off your mask to read the prayer and speak up because... Uh, be nice for people online to be able to hear as well. Thank you.
especially pray for the people of Congo as they struggle in the aftermath of an earthquake and tsunami. Pray for the people of Ukraine as the threat of war hangs over them. And we pray for all victims of the conflict. Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, to name only a few. And for all the refugees seeking a home, security, need light into the distrust and confusion of governments around the world. Give them wisdom and integrity so that they can lead the people of the world well. Put a light into us for our own faults and children so often we are far from our God. Open our ears and our hearts to listen to you more carefully see both our needs and your great salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. It's the moment of quiet for our own prayers this morning. A chance to have a fresh start with God for this new week and for the rest of our lives. So, merciful Father, I accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. When we come to communion today, our next hymn gives us an opportunity to offer ourselves a fresh to God. It's uh, 396 in our hymn books, Just as I am without one plea, no man of God, I am. That's 396. Let's stand.
to uh, those using the books. Yeah, page um, 14 of the books, the Eucharistic Prayer. So let's sit on here as we come before God in prayer. And the heading for others on their service sheets is Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is our true High Priest who has loosed us from our sins and has made us to be a royal priesthood to you, our God and Father. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to you, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted, and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue, a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take Eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Lord and Heavenly Father, in remembrance of the precious death and passion, the mighty resurrection and glorious ascension of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, we offer you through him this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by his merits and death and through faith in his blood, we and all your church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. Although we are unworthy for our manifold sins to offer you any sacrifice, yet, you, yet we pray that you will accept this, the duty and service that we owe. Do not weigh our merits, but pardon our offences, and fill us all who share in this holy communion with your grace and heavenly blessing. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, almighty Father, for ever and ever. Now, if we turn back to the foot of page seven, where you find a modern version of the Lord's Prayer. Can we pray together? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Draw near with faith, receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood, which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith, with thanksgiving. 
we do not presume to come to this your table merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness but in your manifold and great mercies we are not we are worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table but you, you are the same Lord whose nature is always our mercy grant us therefore gracious Lord to so feed the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed with his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. So they say, we're not currently sharing a common cup for reasons of hygiene, as you'll understand, but we do receive by faith his body and his blood as I bring down uh, the, the uh, bread itself to symbolize both uh, as we share communion. If you'd like to receive communion and you uh, know and love the Lord, you're welcome to do so. Um, if you prefer not to, uh, just keep hands down and I'll say a prayer for you as it God's blessing to your life. Special prayer for today. Almighty Father, whose Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, may your people, illumined by your word and sharing your sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, for his life and reigns now and forever. Amen. Let's join together in the prayer of Thanksgiving to the Almighty God. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. It sounds a couple of unfamiliar names this morning, but our final one is one that we're all going to know. Very well, it's number 708 in our hymn books. To God be the glory, great things he has done. Let's stand and sing.
So may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. 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 Amen.